And I now look to Patricia Gallen to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you. It's, it's an honour to be asked to speak at the Oxford Union in a subject that's very close to my heart. I've been a police officer for over 29 years now, and I've got responsibility for specialist crime and operations in the Metropolitan Police Service. It's a staff of about 10,000, 7,000 police officers and 3,000 police staff. Tackling drugs is part of my responsibility with dealing with serious and organised crime. However, this debate tonight, I'm not standing before you speaking just as a senior police officer and not just as a public servant. I'm speaking to you most of all as an ordinary citizen. Because I'm someone who believes in society and I believe the community that we have. I want the best for each and every single one of you as I want for my family and for my friends. I want each and every person in our society to fulfill their dreams and their hopes and to lead a long life. And that's why I say no to drugs. I'm a police officer, but my arguments tonight aren't about law enforcement. That would be far too simple. It's more holistic than that. It's about the serious harm that damage causes to ordinary people. Now, we've just heard the case about MDA made spectacularly, but what about the, high, the, the teenager in London last year who took ecstasy as a good night out, as part of his night out, and collapsed and died? That is a life unfulfilled. What is about the 15-year-old the year before in London who went to an illegal rave where ecstasy is easily given out? He took that as part of his night out. He died, yet again, a life unfulfilled. And then take you to the school teacher who thought she would just try some c crack once it would be all right for her. She took that, she uh, became addicted. Her drug dealer attacked her at the Notting Hill Carnival and she ended up in a coma. Not dead, but a life unfulfilled and too scared to give evidence at court despite arresting the people involved. Now, we can say that these things don't matter, but each and every single one of those deaths, and I'm going to give you some figures later, impacts on people's families, lives, and also the individual. They're left in pieces. So if I start to talk to you a little bit about drugs, we've talked tonight about cannabis. Cannabis is at the bottom end of the scale. Let's talk about Class A drugs. Last year in London alone, we seized 879 kilograms of Class A drugs. Class A drugs, yes, it's your ecstasy, but it's also your cocaine and it's your heroin. These things kill. They destroy lives, and I've given you some examples, and I can give you more. Let's talk about Class B drugs, and I'll talk about cannabis a little bit more and amphetamines, but last year in London, we seized over 5,500 kilograms of drugs. The drugs trade in London, and people can tell you it doesn't do harm. They explicitly are linked to firearms and the criminality and the gunshots and discharges that go on in our streets across the capital. Last year in London, and it is the drugs trade, we seized 895 firearms. Those are firearms that kill people. They kill children and they kill adults and they cause harm and they can get into the hands of terrorists. And we know that from, from analysing it. When we start looking at our organised crime groups that operate across the capital city that are bringing misery to many people, we know that over 50% of those gun crime units, behind them is the drugs trade, fueling misery. And if we start talking about homicides and murders, Whilst these are low in London compared to other major capital cities around the world, in London, 17% of those murders in the year 2014 were directly linked to drug dealing. And then we looked at over three years, the amount of people who'd actually killed somebody in cases of murder, over 17, 14% of those, sorry, had actually been high and using drugs at the time. Now we've mentioned the figures about acquisitive crime that have been mentioned as if that doesn't matter. But actually, each month we drug test people who come into our custody who's been involved in inquisitive crime. Over 53% of those people, about 1,200 people a month, have been taking drugs, and that is fueling the criminality. Those are lives lost. And if we start looking further about what else does drugs do, because it's not simply about taking drugs and what it does to you, it does actually fuel exploitation. If we start looking at prostitution, the most vulnerable in our society, whether that be children or women and those trafficked into the country, those people are taking drugs and have drugs forced upon them. That is the harm that drugs do. 
But if statistics aren't the thing that you think is going to persuade you tonight in terms of the crime that's involved and those of criminality with the drugs, let's talk about Colorado, a city or a state where I visit at least once a year, where they have legalised drug use. In one district alone, where there was a legalised drug factory, there was a 50% increase in young people under 18 admitted to A&E departments. Whilst they're in the A&E department and being treated in hospital, they're not in school, they're not getting an education, and it means they won't have the opportunities that you're having tonight. Yet again, that means they don't get to build the life and the hopes and dreams not only their parents have for them, but they won't fulfil properly in their life. And Points if we of come back... Points of information? Mm. Um, the the, the uh, increase in hospital admissions for the use of cannabis edibles in Colorado has been extensively reported. The actual figures are that it did increase by 50%. I think it went from about 40 odd to about 70 odd. So it was a big increase. But in the meantime, there were about 1,200 children admitted every year for, for, for wrongly eating uh, household cleaning products. And that doesn't, two wrongs don't make a right. We're talking about drugs tonight. And that's the issue I'm putting down. But we will not ever say two wrongs will ever make a right. And I would sit and say that is 40 uh, people too much admitted from before. I'm just putting before. the thing into proportion. Yeah. Well, it's still kids' lives, isn't it? So then we start looking about closer to home and we talk about the deaths that have been taking place. In 2015, the last year we've got statistics, just under 2,500 people died in the UK directly as a result of taking illegal drugs. Now we can sit and say that's been their own choice, but that is again just under two and a half thousand people whose lives have been cut short, who didn't get to lead a fulfilling life. And if we're not worried about the individual harm that the person does to themselves by taking drugs, let's think, as has been spoken about by Andrew, about the other mayhem that's caused in terms of deaths on the roads. If we start looking at the number of people we think are taking drugs and driving, it is excessive. Last year, there were just under 1,500 people convicted of, drink dri of drug driving in the UK. 62 road deaths are directly connected to that. We think probably the causes might actually be higher. But if the general statistic doesn't mean anything, think about Lily Groves, a 14-year-old little girl who was playing with a football in her garden, whose football went out into the road and she ran out and was killed by a driver who'd been taking drugs. Her parents were the one that actually did the campaigning to change the law, but that is the impact of people taking drugs has. And if we start talking about cannabis and people talking about it being a little spliff, in the UK we know it's becoming far more potent and it is having an impact. So Robin Murray's start studying The Lancet in 2015 took about 800 people and looked at the instance of what happens when they took skunk there was a 24% increase in people with psychosis. Psychosis, is that a bad thing? Well, I think it might be. If we start looking at those that were taking it on a regular basis every, time, every day, they were five times more likely to have psychosis, a serious mental illness. Does that make a difference? Well, I'm going to give you two cases which gets to the heart of why it's harm. The first one comes from the United States with the Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, once talked about as a potential presidential candidate. She was gunned down in a supermarket, people might remember, in 2011 in Arizona. The individual that, sh that shot her, as well as killing six people and injuring 13 others, had a mental illness. He put in part of his defence was his condition had deteriorated over several years of taking cannabis, and that's why he had him. In addition, if we then go to the UK, one of the most tragic cases I saw as an assistant commissioner was a man called Dr. Joran Enskin. He went out one day to post a letter and card to his friends telling about the recent birth of his daughter, who was under a month old. He was attacked and killed by a man called Fenny Nadnup. His attacker in defence said that he was actually um, depressed, had psychosis problems, and his psychosis came from taking cannabis over many years in the United States. That was a little girl who lost her father that day, a wife who lost her husband, and an atheist that lost a scientist. If statistics alone aren't enough, think of the real people I've mentioned in each of these cases. A point of information. We are not talking statistics. In those two cases, it's in, in, we're talking about 
self-reported cannabis use, alleged self-reported cannabis use of people who are facing criminal charges? I think the point would be is it's been given in a court of law, it's been taken as part of the defence and a jury has made a decision in that fact and also the sentencing it reflects in that. The fact is these, both of these men took cannabis, very potent cannabis, and as a result they had psychosis. Now the fact of the psychosis also was part of the reason I think they went on to kill and that's part of I think was, was accepted by the courts. So the individual things is some people might not develop psychosis but a lot of people will, and that's no, the harm that's caused. No, point of information. It's a complete... Some people do develop psychosis, but the number of people is tiny. It is literally minuscule. You know, the big scare story in this country has been children getting uh, psychosis as a result of using cannabis. The facts, the actual facts, are that there are an average of just 28 cases each year. Now, those are 28 tragedies, I so don't put that down. But, I mean, the, the vast exaggeration we get is, is, is very misleading. Okay, There's well, I'll very, take, I'll take you back to Sir Robert Murray's study in The Lancet when he looked at 800 cases and 24% had psychosis. Robin so so, so the, the point being is, is we can disagree with about scientists, but the facts have been published in The Lancet as far as I'm concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I appeal to you to sit and say, this isn't about a war on drugs. That would be far too simple. It's not about that at all. It's about the health and well-being of our nation and ensuring that each and every single individual has the opportunity to reach their full potential. That's why this evening I urge you to support this motion and say no to drugs. Thank you.